We are in Luke chapter uh, 6 this week, but we start off every week in Luke chapter 1 verse 4 that says that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught, and our desire is that you may know God's word more um, accurately and that you can have confidence in it. Today, my goal is to blow your mind on the Beatitudes, so let's uh, do that, all right? I want to get a running start at it, and the reason why I want to get a running start at it is I think context is very, very important. So let's go back to Luke 6, uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 6, verse 17, and it says, and he came down with them and stood at a level place. Uh, by the way, the King James Version calls this a plain. So example, there is the Sermon on the Mount, and this is called the Sermon on the Plain. Because, it says, he came down with them and stood at a level place with a great crowd of his disciples, please remember that, and, and a great multitude of people. So we have two distinctive groups, disciples and multitude, from all of Judea and Jerusalem and to the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and healed them all. So what we have is that Jesus is doing what we call the Sermon on the Plain. Now, I need you to understand something about this. this the reason why this becomes important is this. Jesus most likely spoke the same messages multiple places. I think in our brains, we think that every time Jesus taught, it was a new teaching. But what we find out is, is think about it, if you're in a region and his point is to take this basic message, like, for example, what we find in the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, he would go to a different region where those people would not be, and he would most likely say the same thing. Does that make sense? So, for example, Jody and I used to go to these youth pastors' conventions, and in these youth pastors' conventions, we would get really excited. There were different speakers that we really liked. And so we're like, woo, right? And so you're like, we're going to hear, and, and right now Francis Chan is big, but back in the day we were hearing Tony Campolo and we were hearing other people. And the thing that was interesting is we would go to a different conference and we'd like, hey, Tony's here, and then Tony would show up and give the same message that he gave at the last one. Does that make sense? Because in his mind, new audience, why work up a new message? I'll just give the one I gave before. And that's pretty common because, again, the idea is the audience is different. And in the same concept, Jesus would be going to these regions and most likely would be saying the same messages. Therefore, the message on the Sermon on the Mount looks very much like the message of the Sermon on the Plain. Does that make sense? So we have two instances where the basic information is the same. Matthew takes the Sermon on the Mount. Luke takes the Sermon on the Plain. And in doing so, is trying to express this message that Jesus was trying to get across of what was different about the kingdom that he was bringing. Example, you have heard it said that if someone hits you, takes out your eye, you take out his eye. What does Jesus say? If someone hits you on the right cheek, you turn him to the left cheek, right? That message, he would have wanted to say that not only in Judea, but also in Jerusalem. Does that make sense? He's going to want to get that message because it's changing the very perspective of how the law was seen. So I need you to understand this, but this is the part where I think I might kind of blow your mind. And he lifted up his eyes, this is verse 20, this is where our text starts, and he lifted up his eyes and, uh, and eyes on his disciples and said, blessed are those who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Oops, don't go any further. It says, and he lifted up his eyes on his what? Disciples. He's got two groups here. He has a disciple group and he has the multitude. Now watch this. When he says when he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, you have to understand this is different than we expect. The Beatitudes are not for the masses. The Beatitudes are for the disciples. So when he says, blessed are those who are poor, he's not talking the poor of the world. He is talking about a disciple who is poor. That is different than Jesus giving a message to the masses who are poor. But I know that you and I, when we read this, we go, oh, this is Jesus' message. Blessed are the poor, right? That's not his audience. 
his audience, because we are told there is a multitude and a large group of disciples, his audience is his disciples. Look at Luke 7, just to show. At the end of this chapter, all this teaching that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, Luke 7, 1 says, and after he had finished all saying this in the hearing of the people. So this entire time from 6, 20, all the way to 7, 1, who is he teaching? Disciples. But the other people are listening in. I want to say something to you. Please grasp this. Some of you right now would call yourself disciples, and some of you right now are listening in. And that's okay, and you are welcome. But you need to understand that when you are listening in, there may be from this stage language, concepts that may be too difficult for you to grasp not being a disciple. Let me illustrate that. When I was in college, across the way from us was um, Cal State Fullerton. And Jody will tell you that uh, the, the, the group there, if you ever wanted to study, you usually didn't study well at the library at Pacific Christian College because no one really studied in the library at Pacific Christian College. There was a lot of talking in the library of Pacific Christian College, but not necessarily a lot of studying going on. So if I wanted to study, I would go to the library over at Cal State because no one, number one, cared who I was, wanted to talk to me, and would leave me alone. But I remember sitting outside there, and there was a whole construction thing going on that was happening outside. There's a guy giving instructions in construction speak to all of his laborers, which I picked up on a lot of it. I knew most of it, but there were some things I did not know, and I'm listening in. Does that make sense? But to all of those that were listening, all of those cues that were being said to them made sense. Does that make sense? And they were like, yep, yep, da, 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 and off they went. And I'm over here not hearing it all because there was a language being spoke that I knew partial of what it was, but not all of it. You need to understand that when you are coming into a church and hearing Scripture, there are times where you are probably going, I don't quite get that, or I don't quite understand that, or that, may, that doesn't, and I'm, and I'm going to say this, it's supposed to be that way. Christians, those who have given their lives to Christ, start seeing life from a different perspective, and we do start having a different language, sometimes wrong means we just use words because we're not being sensitive to other people. But sometimes it's just concepts that I can say that those who are disciples gather, but those outside would not get the nuances of what I'm saying. And I invite you, if you are someone listening in, to understand I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to say things that are above you, around you. I'm just speaking to the disciples. And in speaking to the disciples, there are things they are going to hear because the Holy Spirit is helping them interpret what's being said. Is that all clear? Here we go. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Not the poor. Disciples who are poor. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what he does not say. Those of you who are followers of me who are poor, getting to know me, I will make you rich today. Do you understand that? There's a lot of prosperity gospel that says if you become a follower, by your becoming a follower through faith will become rich. Ironically, that's not what Jesus says. What he says to them is, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, meaning you will most likely stay in your poverty, but there is something waiting for you that will far outweigh, and when you get there, you will look back and not have a problem with the fact that God kept you poor. And that's hard. Because you have to understand, in this group of disciples, there could have been a man who's impoverished, setting to another disciple who owns wealth and has land, and he's speaking going, 
Blessed are you who are poor, because in your poverty, I'm going to do something in your poverty, and you will see a kingdom, and you will receive a kingdom, and you will get all the blessings of a kingdom. But what he doesn't say is, I'm going to make you rich. He almost says to them, you need to understand, it's not about your financial state. It's about whether or not you have me. Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, present tense. Right now, yours is the kingdom of heaven. You've gotten what you need, which is you get heaven. You get this. It's yours. As soon as you accept me as my, disi- as my disciple, I'm yours. You get this. Present tense. You're in. You're in the kingdom. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. This is future. Yes, you will struggle with your hunger. You will struggle with this place. But there is a time in which you will be satisfied. And what he's saying to them is, is to not look on the now, but realize that there is something. And there's another verse in the Bible says, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And that's the message he's trying to get across to them. Blessed are you who weep now. Ironically, he does not say, I will stop your tears. Do you understand when he says he will stop our tears? We get to heaven when he says, I will dry all tears. Why are they weeping? For many reasons, most likely. But their weeping, most likely, is coming to this fact that they're giving them themselves over and are being honest with their sin and are coming to this place. And he says, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Future tense. Hang in there. And Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Folks, this is the the non-peppiest pep rally of disciples you have ever had. He is looking at them saying, yes, your future is hate by others, exclusion by others, being reviled by others, spurned by others, and all on account of my name. If you accept my name, this is what comes with it. And we sit, and this is, the most, this is the most difficult message to preach in America because I'm telling you, those in third world countries do get what this means. The moment I tell my family I've accepted Christ, the reviling and the spurning and the hatred flows. And he says to them, blessed. By the way, the best translation I can give you for that word is favored. Favored. Favored are you when people. So wait a minute. So what you're saying is, blessed, favored am I when I get all this negativity because I love the name of Jesus? Yes. And by the way, we're back to present tense. It's going to happen now. I'm reading a book. Larry Floyd's here. He gave me this book to read, and I've been reading it. I'm halfway through, and Larry and I both agree. You read this book, and we both don't even feel like we're worthy to be called pastors. And the, it's, it's got this guy named Pastor Yoon from China, and what he goes through. I'm over here going, well, I had to sit on, a, sit on a hard chair for a long time during a meeting. Like, that's my biggest issue I've had to go through. This guy's getting imprisoned and beaten and all this stuff. And every day he's like, thank you, God, for letting me be beaten. Thank you, God, that I'm worthy to be beaten. And I'm going... Well, you know, it's kind of tough. I had to really drive to a really far meeting and skip to lunch. I mean, it just feels bad because in America, we don't get this. We don't get that he, 
Pastor Yoon goes, I'm a disciple of Jesus. And in this, the spurning and the hate and the beating and the separation from his family and how his family while he was in prison was being attacked. And you're sitting there going, this is the reality. And we struggle because we're going, but I don't like this. And this is hard. And yet, Pastor Yoon, thousands upon thousands came to Christ. Prison after prison won to Christ. City official after city official won to Christ. And we struggle through this process. And folks, I'm not trying, look, I know we don't like to be mobile. I get it. It's tough to get here. But folks, can can I tell you, I'm reading this book and there's a part of me goes, I just have no reason to, I, I really don't have any reason to complain. I am not hiding, huddled in my house, whispering praise songs in fear that my next door neighbor is gonna throw me into jail for my faith. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they, exc- when they exclude you and revile you and spurn you and, then, um, and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man, exclamation point. I think Jesus got a little heated at this moment. But I want to say something to you. Listen to the blessings of God for the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 41.10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have, um, I have made and will bear and will carry and will save. Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Those are the passages that goes to those who are poor, who are hungry, who have been reviled. Those are the words of encouragement. Blessed are you. Are you. Rejoice in that day. And leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. So their fathers did to the prophets. Now let me tell you something. That is not a future tense. Rejoice in that day when Jesus comes. It says rejoice in that day when you are reviled. Rejoice in that day when you are persecuted. Rejoice in that day when they hate you. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Now, can I just tell you how awkward it would be when someone latches out to you? I hate you because you're a Christian. You're like, woo! Yeah! It would change the mood, by the way. (laughs) When someone comes in and goes, we're taking your house because you're a follower of Jesus. Woo! By the way, you know who heard this message? His disciples. Because when... The men flogged them. They leaped with joy and rejoiced because they were counted worthy to be beaten for the name of Jesus. So how do we take the the, the stuff that is taken from us? How do we take when people want, we just sit there and we go, God, you are doing something for me. If I'm going to be your disciple and it costs me everything, then in that process, how do I rejoice in that moment because I trust you that whatever you have for me, whatever you have for me is greater than anything they're going to take from me or anything they're going to say about me or anything they're going to do for me because I have you and you are enough. Now, this is where it gets hard. Because what we want to do at this moment is make rich people the issue. Who is the audience? Who's the audience? Do not switch in your brain to make this another group outside the church. He is still addressing disciples. But woe to you who are disciples and are rich. 
You see what we try to do in that? We read that and we want to make it another group. He is still talking. And by the way, the poor person's going, okay, he's not taking me out of my poverty. Do you understand that? There was nothing in what he said that says at this moment he is taking me out of my poverty. You know what he said? Look forward to another day. Look forward to another time. And I'm telling you it'll be worth it. That's what he said to the poor. To the rich, all of a sudden, I want you to know this got very uncomfortable. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Basically, you're getting it now. I'm not telling you about a future thing, because you're getting it now. Now, those who are onlookers are listening in are going, ooh, that's pretty heavy teaching to these followers, disciples of Jesus. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Yeah, you're eating now. You're full now. But because that is what you want, a full stomach more than me, there will be a time when you'll be hungry. Woe you want to be, have your riches define you, that's great, then this is what you get in this life, but don't be looking to something later. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And here's the kicker. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. What does this mean? He's looking at the rich saying this, if you keep relying on your money, if you keep relying on the fact that you have made deals with everybody and everybody likes you, which means you've had to compromise to make sure everybody likes you. Because if you hold, let me just say this, if you hold the line of Christ, you are going to upset someone. If in every conversation you find a way to make sure that everyone likes you, you have somewhere turned your back on Christ. And he's saying to his disciples that our rich, who by the way have said that it's more important to be liked on this earth, who say it's more important to laugh now, who say it's more important to be full now, he's saying to them, that's great, enjoy what you have now because the future does not have what you think it has. And by the way, because you are rich, you're not entitled to what's at the other end. Now, let me say this to you. There is nothing wrong with having money. There is nothing wrong with having money. But there is something wrong to have money be the reason why you do what you do. Instead of it being the tool that is used for you to do the things of God, when it becomes the motivating factor, where if God says, hey, I need you to do this, you're like, no, I can't do that because that would cost me too much money. Or I can't do this because I've got to have this job, or I've got to do this because this is what's going to define me, then you've missed the point. And he's looking at the rich saying, look, this is difficult for you. I get it. But I'm telling you, you are relying and putting your weight on what cannot sustain you. You are leaning on what is going to fall down. We've all experienced that. You lean against something you thought was solid, you thought was going to hold your weight, and found yourself on the floor. And the riches of this world and the relationships of having everyone like you is leaning against something that will not sustain you and you will find yourself on the ground. And these people who are listening are listening to him say very difficult things. Those of you who are poor, guess what? You're probably going to stay that way, but you get a blessing on the end that you cannot even imagine. Those of you who are rich, you better enjoy it now because if that's where you keep your focus, you are not getting the blessing on the other side. And he is saying this to his disciples, not to those who are outside. One of the biggest mistakes we do in the church is take scriptures that are meant for those inside the church and apply them to those outside the church, and they don't apply. They don't apply. Folks, if I meet somebody out of the church and they are living, eating, drinking, and being merry, do you know the Bible says they're doing exactly what they should be doing? Because the scripture says, if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And in their world, right, 
They're doing exactly what I should be doing if Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead. But guess what? He has risen from the dead, and therefore I don't. I told you before, I listened to a guy named Penn Jillette, who's an atheist. That guy eats, drinks, and he is merry. He is living it out because he doesn't believe in God. And what he is doing makes absolute sense to me. But for me to impose upon him that which is in the church is wrong. Until he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, he's not held to those responsibilities. But he's also doomed in his sin. But we need to be very careful in the church that we look at people and start to put stuff that is meant for us on them when that's not their weight to carry. There's enough issues within the church before we go attacking anybody outside the church. And Jesus is looking at his disciples. And I know some of you are like, I've read the Beatitudes 100 times. And I kept thinking it was for everybody. It's not. It's for those who are disciples. Because we should live different. More should be expected of us. And Jesus, when he was with his disciples, never used kick gloves. He blasted them every single time. When you get done, by the way, I just finished the last woe. You got a group going, great, I get to stay poor to the end, but I get, woo, right? And the rich are going, oh, maybe I need to rethink this. Disciples who are poor, hungry, weeping, and rejected are exalted with the coming of the kingdom. And disciples who are rich, well-fed, laughing, and socially accepted are brought low and judged. It comes down to this. You will either love this world and play its game, and with that, you need to understand you have limited the blessing on the other end, or you will understand that whatever God does to you in this earth, he has a blessing that is waiting for you that will make what you are going through seem like nothing and worth it. And I don't like preaching this sermon. I want to say, those of you who are poor, come to me, and I'll take care of you and make you rich. That's what I want to say. But here's what's interesting. Jesus is just fine leaving us in the place that we are and going, I can give you peace there purpose there and fulfillment there, I don't have to change your financial status or I don't have to change anything to make me be real where you are. But this doesn't preach well in a lot of churches, so we avoid these conversations. Because those who are listening in are going, so wait a minute, so I come to Jesus and there's a good chance that I get to stay in the financial state that I've been through the rest of my life? Yeah. Well, then don't sign me up, and I understand until you understand that you get something deeper inside that is far greater than what this world has to offer. I know that the toys look fun. I know that the big houses see, and I get that. But my question is this. Do I want those things for the short time I have on this earth, or do I want him for eternity? Because that's what it comes down to. I had a kid in my youth group. I would have sworn on everything that I had known that this kid would have ended up being in the ministry. And he very directly said, nope, I want the stuff. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. One's got to die. And you make choices of who dies every day. We're going to spend the rest of our time in James 4, 1 through 5. Going, you're supposed to be speaking in Luke. I can do what I want. James 4, 1 through 5. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? I want you to think about that. Again, we're not talking about non-believers. This is a letter written to the church in Jerusalem. The audience is not the world. By the way, 
very little of the New Testament can be said it was written to the world. Does that make sense? Every Thessalonians, Corinth, Galatia, Philippi, those are all written to the church of that. Do you understand who the audience is? And again, do not make the mistake of, that, of saying to that which is for the inside on the outside. James says this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Within the church. Do you understand that? What causes quarrels and fights among you within the church? Context. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? If you find out a fight within the church, most likely you can come to find out there is a passion at war. I want my way. I want to look the way I want it. I want to listen to my style of music. I want the pastor to wear the clothes I want him to wear. I would like him to iron them once in a while. Whatever your fight is, <laughs> it's because there's something in you that there's a passion. Oh, well, they chose to have their event on my night, and they knew it was my night, and they chose to do that because they wanted their event to be good and my event to be bad. Or I was dumb as a youth pastor and didn't know that I should have checked the calendar before I did my event. Maybe that was the answer. Maybe I shouldn't have been called before the elders because I chose an event to do it on the night of your event, trying to sabotage your event. Maybe you could have come to me and said, I think you're a little bit of an imbecile, and maybe you should understand you should check the calendar so this doesn't happen in the future. I'm sorry. I'm just going back in time. So the idea is, <laughs> is that what happens is, is that in this, we get to our passions, and guess what? I rarely have found in myself, and probably most likely in you, we rarely think the best of people. We always think the worst. They meant to come into my lane today. They got up this morning and said, the first blue car I come to, I am coming into their lane. And because of that, they're going to get the horn, and they're going to get some digits, and this is why, because they came into my lane, because that's how they came. Folks, because when you come into someone's lane without meaning it, that's what you thought that morning. Who can I cut off today, right? No. No. See, the thing is, we go to this negative place when we realize our issues are our passions that are within us. Someone stepped on my passion. Someone didn't fulfill my passion. Someone didn't give me my passion. And in doing so, I've been hurt and I've been burdened. And now we're going to have a good old-fashioned church fight. Woo! When I started to name inroads inroads, I was sitting with a guy named Mark Leeper. And Mark Leeper goes, the longest sign he ever saw on the name of a church was 27 words long. Which means they had split 27 times. Do you understand that? It was the first congregational Baptist, blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying? It's like it was crazy. They had to add an extra board to the bottom of the sign to keep writing the names on the bottom of the sign. Because they had a good old-fashioned church fight over the fact that someone ordered the blue robes instead of putting on the choir in the bread robes. If you don't think that's what happens, you'd be wrong. I've seen church fights over carpet and paint. When we first started inroads, one of the reasons why they were those horrible colors is I made this statement. I made it horrible. No one liked them. Therefore, everybody was on the same page. <laughs> What's so funny is they like, do you like them? Eh. All right, here we go. You desire, listen. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Folks, we're still talking within the church. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own what? Passions. If it is right and true, and we ask in the name of God, he says he is faithful to give it. But I'll tell you what, we have to understand our passions. But this is where I want us to get. You adulterous people. I still love that he's talking to the church. I think that's why James is not liked, by the way. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. 
I got to explain all that. Let's go back. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Which means is when we love the world, when the disciples love the money and they love the laughter and they love the food and, and, they, and they love all those things, then please understand you are choosing the world over God and you cannot serve two masters. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself enemy of God. And we do the stupid thing trying to live in both worlds which means we do nothing well. Or this quote that is very powerful. Or do you suppose it is, no pur- it is to no purpose that the Scripture says, oh, this is deep. He yearns jealously. jealously ah, it's happening. No, I'm just getting old. He yearns <laughs> jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Folks, I am spirit in here. I've been given a body of flesh, but I'm a spirit in here, and he is jealous over me. And when he sees this spirit take its eyes and put it on the things of this world, he gets very jealous. Does he not want me to enjoy nice things? No, he wants me to enjoy nice things. He wants to give me good gifts because he's a good father, but he does not want me to put the gifts over the father. I want you to imagine that. Father comes home, brings his kid, something. doesn't matter right now in our house for Zach. If I brought him uh, stuff with Star Wars, I am the king right now because Star Wars is ruling right now. But if I gave it to him, he can say this, oh, I love it, Dad. Thank you so much, and I love you, right, for giving it to me. But what hurt me is if I gave him the gift, and he turned and held the gift and says, I love you, and you fulfill me. And all I want is you, Jedi Master Troy. Jedi Master Troy, you fulfill me, and you're what I live for, and you're what I need, and every day all I want is you, Jedi Master Troy. Are you hearing me? There are good things in this world, but those good things are to direct us to the God who gave them to us. Food is great. And we should give thanks and gratitude to a God who gives us and makes us good food. Amen? Friendships are good. And we should thank God that he has created us to enjoy them. But nothing... Nothing should get in the place of him. And so he's back. Let's go back to our passage. He's looking at his disciples and saying this. If you're poor, I'm good enough. And if you're rich, I'm better than. Did you hear me? If you're poor, I'm good enough. And you will be sustained and fulfilled, and this will all make sense. But if you're rich, I'm better than, and you better choose who you're going to cuddle with tonight. Are you going to cuddle with Jedi Master Toy or with me? For I am jealous over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. He is jealous for you. And by the way, when he sees you putting your eyes on something else, he goes, ha, 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 no. And I think God gets a little catty. What I wanted you to grasp from today's passage is that the Beatitudes are for you who are disciples. And if you're not there yet and you're listening in, some things I might have said today might have come across too hard or might have not been clear. I understand. But if you're a disciple, you've got to wrestle with what has been said today. You have to wrestle with the fact that God says I might keep you exactly where you're at, but I'm good enough and I'm worthy enough. And if you have, you might need to understand it can't be better than him. I will finish with this. The way the system works is that God blesses people. And in my life, it was Dr. John Schmidt. Dr. John Schmidt 
um, back when there was uh, the Great Recession under uh, before Reagan and all that fun stuff, uh, owned hospitals. So Dr. Schmidt um, worked nine months out of the year, and three months he took off. That's good for a doctor, go on vacation, hang out. No. Dr. Schmidt would work for nine months out of the year, and for three months before Russia had actually, the walls had come down, would go into orphanages in Russia, in Russia and would actually do medical services for free for orphans in Russia. Dr. Schmidt had a 1972 Plymouth. He could have bought a BMW, he could have bought a Mercedes, he could have bought all things. His joke was, I'm going to drive this car until the tires go bald. And he says, for some reason, for the last five years, these tires have never gone bald. You would never look at his house and think it was a doctor's house. Because anything he had extra, he gave it away. He had been given a house in Malibu. The church was going to be doing a renovation of their building and was going to be doing this extension. He decided to sell the house, the Malibu house, to help pay for that, which the elders were quite upset about because that's where the elders used to go on their retreats, and they were not excited that the Malibu house was going away. But nonetheless, he sold the Malibu house to give it away. Come to find out there was something that was done with the land that, let's say, again, I don't know the numbers, and, and the math is all wrong because inflation and everything else. So let's say he sold the house for $100,000, which if the Malibu house was more than that. Let's just say that. He took all 100% of it and gave it to the church. Something had to do with the land. There was this thing where the city came back and gave him $200,000 for a mistake they had made. So he gave away $100,000. The city gave him $200,000. Dr. John could not give money away fast enough. And God would bless him. Here's the point. It was never about the money for Dr. John. It was a tool that let him go to Russia and be with orphans. It was a tool that let him... Be with people. When I got lost in the mountains and I broke my ribs and punctured a lung, that's a fun story. And if you haven't heard it, take me to coffee and I'll tell you. He did all my medical stuff for free because I was a kid in the youth group. I was in the hospital, paid all my bills, came off vacation because it was Christmas when it happened to take care of me. To this day, Dr. John Schmidt is one of my favorite people in the world. And the reason why, because he lived it out. There's nothing wrong with having money. And there's nothing wrong with being poor. It's who is your God at the end of the day? And how do you live for him and because of him? I think you've had enough. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. And I ask that you would wrestle us through. I want this passage to be about the world. I want this passage to be about the poor. I want this passage to be about the rich that are out there. But that's not who you're saying it to. You're saying it to those who call themselves disciples who say that we're following you. And you're challenging us to go deeper and to go truer and to be in the right place because of your love. I thank you. I thank you that you bless us. And I ask that you would do so today. And that you would be enough that you would be enough, dear God, that you would be enough. In Jesus' name, amen.